Welcome to the podcast that puts a finger on the pulse of medicine and technology. On this show, you'll hear from investors, industry executives, and healthcare providers on the science and business of medicine. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib, and this is the State of MedTech. All right, and we are live. Well, not live in, in general, but we're live recording. You ready to go, Dave? I'm ready. Let's Perfect. Are you ready for the best med tech podcast intro of all time? You, I am you ready for so ready for that. Let's hear here, it. Here, here it is. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to this amazing show. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib, and your head of state for the state of med tech. It's been a long time coming, ladies and gentlemen. But finally, I got a chance well, digitally to meet Dave Scott. Dave Scott and I have been connected through LinkedIn. We first got connected when I was aware of his work over at Verb Surgical. Now he's CEO at an extremely exciting company. And I don't say that lightly, you know, called Hyperfine, who in my opinion is doing some really amazing things because as much of a technologist as I am, let's just face it, there's, there's med tech companies out there who I will not name, come up with beautiful technology, exciting technology, but guess what? It provides an very incremental improvement on healthcare and just skyrockets the cost. Hyperfine is doing something very different and it's very refreshing to see this. I'm very excited and happy about that. Uh, note, no, this is not a sponsored podcast by Hyperfine, but then I can't help but admire what great work this company is doing. And I'm also putting it on them to just make sure they really challenge the status quo and change it. So Dave, thank you so much for joining us and for my physician audience who found out that you're uh, that I was interviewing you, I have to say one thing: rock chalk Jayhawk. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and with Omar, that, thanks, thanks so much. Super excited to be on your show. Absolutely, and you know, with that one and, statement, I gained I gained some 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 audience, but I probably lost a bunch of people who uh, listen in their K State fans. So, you know, but what, yeah. what, what can you do? <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to. I'm going to Jayhawk. Uh, game here in a couple of months, so I'm super excited. I haven't I haven't been back to Allen Fieldhouse in years. So oh, you, that's have awesome. Seen, have you ever seen a game at Allen Fieldhouse? I've never, but so I went to the University of Texas El Paso, aka Texas okay. Western, first school with an all black uh, team to win a national championship, and the Jayhawks uh, put put a serious butt whooping on us a few weeks ago. <laughs> well, but, but it's okay. Allen Fieldhouse is hard. <laughs> Allen Fieldhouse is is like the heart of basketball. It's it's an amazing place to watch a basketball game. It, it really if you ever is. get a chance, to, you should definitely try to go. It's just it's insane. I I, I, won't, I won't do I won't do the whole rock chalk Jayhawk thing for you here on the oh, but, show. But you have to go live it, that in person. I mean, if you feel compelled to, I mean, this shows this <laughs> well, shows all about self expression. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it with you. <laughs> we'll do it. Yeah. That would be fun. We'll do. It, we'll, do we'll go to. A, we'll go to a game in Allen Hill Fieldhouse, and that'll be the right way to do it. Well, that that is that is absolutely correct. Otherwise, people who are right now working, they're going to be like, "What the hell is our CEO doing?" Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, for for those audience who are aware of you, you know, a lot of people know know of you and, and the work you, you're doing at, at Hyperfine. But I want to start with your origin story. You know, mm. who is Dave Scott? Where where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? You know, you, I know you yeah. spent some time at Apple as an injured. Where did you start and how did you end up where you are today? Yeah, well, okay. So you want to go way back. Um, way back. So uh, I, I, had an, I had an awesome uh, childhood. I, I grew up in a tiny little farm town in southwest Missouri called Lamar, Missouri. It's the birthplace of Harry Truman. And uh, so a little shout out to, to Lamar, Missouri. I don't know if anybody's listening. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's near Joplin, Missouri. That's kind of the closest bigger town. So population 4,000, you know, we had, it was a one st literally a one stoplight town. Um, you know, it was the county seat. So every year we had the, the county fair, the carnies would come to town and, and set up the, set up the fair. We had the rodeo and 4-H and, and that whole thing. And it was just, a, just an awesome place to grow up. If you, do you know the show Friday Night Lights? The TV I'm series, from, Dave. I'm from Texas. I absolutely You're from Texas. Know yeah, I definitely okay, so, know that. So show. this is the this is kind of the you know equivalent version of that in a way. But in Missouri, all of, but in Missouri, it was all about football. It's all about sports, and everybody um, knew you. You couldn't get away with anything. Oh, you walk down the street. You walk down the street, and and uh, I mean, I have a funny story about that. When I went to college, when I my freshman year, first day on campus. So this is at KU, and you know, I'm walking uh, on the campus in Lawrence, and um. 
I'm walking on the sidewalk and I'm, you know, walk past someone. Hi, hello. You know, I'm waving hello at everybody I walk past because, you know, that's, growing that's what up you in a do. small town, it's what you do. If you walk past someone and you didn't say hello, it was rude. It was weird. Uh, and, and I'm walking on campus and people are like looking at me. I'm like, why is everybody looking? And I'm like, okay, clearly I can't be saying hi to everybody. This is not sustainable. But that's that's the kind of town I grew up in. It was I loved it. It was a, it was a great place to grow up. I love it. Yeah, and similar, similar to me, I, I grew up in El Paso, Texas. Definitely mm-hmm. bigger, 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 uh, bigger city, um, but small yeah. town feel. Same, same thing. Walk down the street, you say hi to people. And so when yeah. I moved out of El Paso, I went to other cities. I know the feeling where you're walking. It's weird not to look at somebody in the eye and just even smile yeah. and say hello. Yeah, so, it's rude. It's rude, and I still have a lot of that in me today. What did um, you study in KU, by the way? Yeah. So, so, you know, I was that kind of stereotypical kid growing up in, you know, the cornfields laying in, laying in the cornfields at night, staring up at the stars. And I, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut. So I, uh, went to Did college. Did you have a Carl study. Sagan poster? Oh, I, I had, I had, you know, I had Carl Sagan books. I, I watched Cosmos all the time and, and, you know, all, all of those. I have to know, ask, I have to Star ask Star Trek. Question. And, so, so Star Wars or Star Trek? Both. Oh, but you have to I mean, pick, if you have to pick one. Oh, have to pick. I mean, I I guess I'd have to if you forced me to pick, uh I would I would have to pick Star Trek because I go way back to like all of the original episodes and it was just it was just a conti- you know, continuing um story for years and years and years. Um Star Wars has a few a few too many plot plot line holes in it for me. I, <laughs> I agree. I love Star Wars. You know, All the Star Wars <laughs> lovers are going to hate me now. No, you, uh, uh, the Star Wars hater, uh, lovers are going to hate me when I say this. You know what, you know, because my wife, when we talked, I, we were talking about Star Wars, Star Trek the other night. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not this huge fan in Star Trek, but I love it. I do like it. Yeah. And she's like, well, what's the difference between the two? And I was like, oh, no one's really asking. And I, the best answer I can come up with is like, Star Trek is the thinking man's Star Wars. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I just yeah. I just lost more audience. Just lost more audience. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Totally, totally. We better change the subject. But um, but yeah. So I, you know, I was that stereotypical, you know, farm boy kid staring up at the stars in the cornfield and, and saying, "I want to go to the stars." And um, the nearest, you know, the University of Kansas had a ha, has a really great aerospace program. Uh, Wichita uh, is a center of of um, aviation, so there's a lot of um, companies that build various aircraft out of Wichita. And so they fund, they provide a lot of funding to the University of Kansas for their, for their aerospace program. So they had a great aerospace program. It was kind of a no brainer, you know, being a, you know, farm, farm boy, it was a, uh, close, close to home. Um, you know, and, and it was a state school didn't cost much. And in fact, it was, I, I think I paid $700 a semester, um, back then. Wow. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you what year that was. But um and so yeah, so studied studied aerospace engineering and um and then and then after that uh did a did a, a couple of um a couple of internships at NASA at Dryden at Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California. And that's where I kind of got steered away from the astronaut training program. There was a guy there that had been through the astronaut training and long story short, he talked me out of it. Mm. for a bunch of reasons. Um, and that's when I went back to graduate school in Boulder, stayed in aerospace, but Boulder had a program in aerospace that was focused on life science and the effects of microgravity on humans. Fascinating. And so that, in, that kind of intrigued me, like, you know, the, the human element, the body. Um, and, but yet it was still in aerospace. And so I, I went to, uh, I went to the university of Colorado in Boulder for graduate school Unfortunately, and I was there to get a PhD, and unfortunately, my advisor passed away of a, of a heart attack mm. early on. And I, so I just finished up with my master's degree and then went to uh, Lawrence Livermore, straight out of there, went to Lawrence Livermore Lab, where I, that was really my first job out of college. And, um, and uh, started. That was out here in California, class. right? Yeah, Livermore is in the East Bay, about 45 minutes minutes uh, east of San Francisco. Very well respected place for a lot of the younger audience who may have heard of it or are not familiar. Very well respected place. A lot of great, great tech science that came out of there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, it's part of that whole Department of Energy um, National Laboratory Program. Uh, so across the country, there's a bunch of these national labs. And so it's really a, a talent hub for scientists, engineers, physicists, 
Um, and so I, I got there at a time where uh, the national laboratories were being shifted away from nuclear weapons research mm. and being kind of directed more towards things like bioscience, biomedical engineering, environmental science. And that's when I got into medical devices there. So I was in a, a program there called the medical uh, MTP medical technology program, and we were developing medical devices. So one of my first projects or programs there was uh, we were developing a non-invasive um, uh, breast cancer screening system using ultrasound in 3D. Mm. And um, another really interesting story. So we, you know, we we built this prototype of a system uh, using ultrasound to do three-dimensional ultrasound uh, of the breast, and and so we were imaging phantoms, and we had a a, a partnership with the Carmanos Cancer Institute, so they were funding the project. And I remember very clearly they came out for the uh, for the program review after we had built this prototype and we had all these great results. And we present all these results and we're super excited and everyone's excited. And then we said, you know, and the only the only caveat is you need a Cray supercomputer to calculate all the data because it was just tremendous amounts of data. And, um, you know, it was it was a great idea that was just ahead of its time because the computing power, you know, you know, and that's why they came to Livermore for the project because we had the access to these Cray supercomputers. So, um, so unfortunately, that that kind of caused that. You know, we we the 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 project ended. We wrapped it all up, and um, and then just to kind of like fast forward, just to to close the loop on that story. Years later, my CEO, a guy named Mark Forche, awesome, awesome guy. Um, in fact, you got to have him on the show at some point. I'll introduce you. But I would love he that. He was the CEO. He was the CEO of Optometica, so that Optometica was oh, the, we the know that company name. that, yeah, we we built a system for laser cataract surgery and we sold that to Abbott. But um, uh, he contacts me one day, uh, you know, this is after Opt Optometica, and he was looking at his next CEO role, and he's like, "Hey, didn't you work in ultrasound? Because I'm talking to this 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 you know startup company that's doing breast cancer screening and." I'm like, yeah, I worked on that, you know, years ago at Livermore. And I'm like, tell me about it. He's like, yeah, it's something out of Carmona's Cancer Institute. And I'm like, wait, what? And he starts telling me more. It turns out it was the same group of people at Carmona's. They had taken all the technology that we had developed. And then finally, computing power had caught up. Wow. And and they were like, okay, this is now the time. They started a company. They had then built that prototype and were you know, off to the races. And so he, he was hired as a CEO. I, I had the old overhead slide projectors. If you remember overhead slides. I definitely remember right those. On. And so I photocopied, I took my camera, took pictures of these old slides that I had used to present back in the day and sent them to him. And I was like, dude, look at this. Like, the, like, like here's the original math equations for all the stuff that you guys are doing. Um, anyway, so it was kind of a really interesting, like closing the you know, really long loop there. I, was I mean, it, say, was a, it, it was like a 20 year, yeah, like a 20 year loop on that. Yeah. Um, and it, that's that, especially as an engineer, like that must've felt so good because so many times, you know, product, you know, people who are product leaders, engineers, you work on something and it's just, it's just the timing's not right and everything. And then yeah. things change and you look back and be like, man, we were just a little bit too early. And I can think of so many yeah. stories like that from the Valley. But yeah. that, that's like the, the best, that's the first full circle uh, thing I've heard happening like that. Yeah. I, I think that's it like a one my, in a million. It blew my mind. It blew my mind. And it was so cool that it was, you know, a project that I had worked so intimately on and really uh, my first serious, you know, engineering program um, and, and to see it kind of go full circle. And now they are, that company, the company's called Delfina. So a little plug for Mark and for Delfinas. I think they're just kicking, kicking butt and, and just doing, doing really well. And, um, and, uh, and super exciting to see that technology finally make it. What was, what was one of the, uh, you know, you mentioned that this was kind of like a big, a big role for you. Um, what was, what were some of the, like the big, I want us to call them painful, even painful things that you had to go through that that changes your character for the better. Oh wow! Um, I mean, at that time, you know, looking at that project, it was um, it was it was probably at the time it was just the the just nose to the grindstone, hard hard work, hours and hours a day of 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 working through really, really hard problems. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, lots and lots of long hours, 
to to figure out um, the the basically developing the the math and the and the the physics around how to do um, ultrasound three dimensional reconstruction using ultrasound. This is before any of that stuff existed. So we we kind of you know did the very very early work on that. So yeah, I mean that was. Um, you know, and there, you know, the lot. I mean, you know, failure is part of it. We didn't even think of it as failure, right? It's you know, you build a prototype, it doesn't work, but it's just learn. You, you just build and learn, build and learn, build and learn, and um, and 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 that's you know stuck with me ever since. Is you know that, that there's no problem that's too hard if you just don't if you put it you know smart people together on it and and you and you put your head down and you work hard and you just keep learning and you try and you you will learn from your failures is it, 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 it turns into magic. You know, I, I absolutely agree. And, and I don't think, I don't believe in coincidences anymore, but you know, uh, recently I'm actually, this has been a great week as you know, I spoke to Scott Hunnikins earlier. I have you on today. Uh, the great Jeffrey Moore, who's the author of crossing the chasm, all those Silicon yeah. Valley greats, you know, he, he mm -hmm. wrote a book recently on metaphysics, you know, kind of distilling mm -hmm. all this, you know, knowledge of business, but turning it into like, what is, the, what is the meaning of life? And he talks about this where, you know, in the natural world and in the, you know, physical world, this concept of evolution has to do with like forward progress, failure, and then reiteration, you know, and I think yeah. that a lot of the, a lot of the focus of innovation has to do with that, which is when you fail and things, you know, things blow up in your face, it's really just a way to take in that information and then make the right adjustments and just do it again and again and again. Do you feel like that's sometimes lost on people? I feel like these, my generation and a lot of people today are just not patient enough to stick it out through failure. Am I wrong in saying that? Maybe I'm being a little extreme. No, I mean, you know, I definitely see that. I mean, there's like a, um, you know, people want quick, quick gratification. And, um, you know, in my career, I've always been attracted to super hard problems, right? So, starting out in aerospace engineering and then, um, you know, building a, you know, system that does three dimensional screening using ultrasound that requires a Cray supercomputer. And then after that, I, I, um, I joined a startup. We were developing high resolution X-ray tomography that just didn't exist at the time. We have the highest resolution X-ray microscope in the world, 20 nanometer resolution X-ray mm. microscope. And then, uh, and then intuitive surgical, you know, surgical robotics. Um, and and the, you're there in the early cat, days. Fairly, fairly early days, uh, 2006, um, you know, and then, and then laser cataract surgery. And then, you know, so I, I kind of, I kind of go, I'm attracted to these really, really hard problems that take a long time to get to a successful result. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I'm, I'm kind of trained myself to, you know, see, you know, see the long picture, but, but you're right. I mean, a lot of people are expecting immediate gratification and, and immediate results and, and especially in hard problems, it just doesn't work that way. You know, I think Absolutely. Einstein has a famous quote that, you know, he's something, and I'm going to, I'm going to botch this, but something to the effect of that, you know, he, he's not smarter than anybody else. He just sticks with the problem longer. Um, I, I think there's, some, it, there's a lot to be said about that too. A lot, a lot to be said about that. I mean, even this example, right, where what we developed was 20 years too early. Uh, you know, Carmano stuck with it. You know, they could have walked away from it, and that all of that, all of that know-how and and that that information could have been in a file drawer somewhere, completely forgotten. But there's a couple of guys there that that believed in it and and uh, stuck with it and and pulled, you know, dusted that stuff off when, when computing power finally, uh, you know, got to the level that was required to, to, to make that a, a viable technology. So, um, there's something really special in that long view. That's amazing. And, and thank you for sharing that. I mean, one of the reasons why I started this podcast was, you know, people, you know, especially young professionals. I mean, I moved out to the, to the Valley many years ago because I wanted to be close to the heart to hear stories like that. And a lot of times they're not captured. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, I tell people all the time that I don't believe in this concept that like you don't have an idea, you know, because a lot of times people have the same idea. So how does that happen? I really have this belief that people don't have ideas. Ideas have you, you know, and it sounds like the, this group of people were essentially possessed by this idea that made it see through yeah. to fruition, you know, as a, as a commercial. They really guy, were right. I mean, they they and that's what it takes with these with with a lot of startups is, uh, 
you you have to be willing to hang on and believe in the idea when everybody else is telling you that you should turn the lights off you know exactly and go home. exactly everything's impossible until the data is not i got to ask yeah. you though and i don't know if 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 some if you've reflected on this for myself i i, I relate a lot to what you just said because as a commercial guy specifically in marketing i i could be doing a lot you know i can i can be much better off if i go into internet software, these kind of things that don't have the constraints yeah. that our industry has, but I'm right. just deeply attracted to extremely complicated things that don't even have a market, surgical robotics, <laughs> AI, predictive health. And it sounds like you have the right. same thing, you know, same thing. And again, based on your career, you can go yeah. anywhere. What, what about these hard, complicated, and again, long-term problems? What, like, what about it gets you excited? Like, why are you drawn to them? Wow. I mean, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it goes back to, you know, back to being in aerospace engineering. And I, I just was, I was fascinated with airplanes and spacecraft and the comp and the complexity of those things and super complex systems, right? Multiple systems that require multiple disciplines, you know, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, software mm. engineering, and now, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, um, I mean, we were doing robotics before they called it robotics, right? You know, we, we called it instrumentation engineering back in the day. I know you probably don't, you probably. That's a first for me. Yeah. To, no, no. Yeah. I'm, I got to add that to my lexicon. Instrumentation engineering is what robotics. Yeah. Used to be I mean, called. I mean, Didn't that's, that. that's, you know, if you go back, back to like early days of like uh, wafer fab facilities, okay, um, where they're setting up again, they didn't call it robots back then, but you know, um, gantry systems for moving wafers around those people were like instrumentation engineers, right? They, mm. they sort of have a diverse skill set of putting different things together to make, to make, uh, to make that work. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 I've just been attracted to complex systems and, and hard problems. And then, and then simultaneously really wanting to, to contribute, um, in a way that I felt like was making a difference in the world. And so that drew me to, to healthcare. So, you know, I kind of put that Venn diagram together of super hard problems combined with, with healthcare and that, that, you know, that led me to surgical robotics, um, image, you know, complex imaging systems, that ultra, ultrasound, uh, systems, things like that. So Interesting. that's probably the, the root of it. I want to dig just a little bit more because I know that there's going to be, especially all the, all the students that I, I, that usually, uh, follow me or listen to, you know, specifically out of Berkeley, um, you know, I think a lot of younger people are pushed to, to, to find a niche and focus and specialize in it, which is perfectly fine. But there are people that have this interest to, to kind of go broad and learn about a few, few like large, broad areas. And it sounds like mm -hmm. that's, that's okay to do because I mean, uh, let, let me know if I'm off here. I, I think things turned out pretty well for you, for you follow, following your intuition and following that path. I mean, what, what's your advice to students and young professionals who, who have that same, same interest? Yeah, I think, I think it's, there's no, there's multiple, you know, paths to Nirvana, right? So, um, you know, but you, you, you got to follow, follow what you feel your passion is, um, and follow what inspires you, you know, because, at the end of the day, and this sounds very cliche, but it isn't about the destination. It's about the journey. And, and if you're not enjoying the journey, um, then what's, then what's the point? And a lot of people are, are so focused on the, on the destination. Um, and they're, and they're, they end up not getting the destination they were hoping for, and they didn't enjoy the journey. So they got nothing. Uh, and so I think that's probably a, a lot of people fall into that trap. They see a lot of, you know, maybe they see, you know, uh, startups and young entrepreneurs making a lot of money at, you know, by the time they're 30 years old and billionaires, uh, you know, starting some app and selling it for a hundred million dollars. Uh, and they're, they're, they're after that destination and, and they don't, they kind of set aside the, the fact that they don't really enjoy the journey. And, and so I think, I think, you know, if you're going to commit yourself to something, you got to make sure you're passionate about it and that you're going to enjoy the journey and, and just truly really remind yourself that, of that every day that, you know, am I enjoying the journey here? Because, um, once the destin, once you reach the destination, you're just going to be searching for a new destination, right? You'll never, the destination doesn't make you happy. It's the journey. 
And so I think that would be my advice if I were talking to a young person coming out of college. That's that's great advice. I think that's great advice for anybody, really, even people who are mid-career, because I think you know it's very easy, especially in, in the Western world with Instagram and TikTok and all these things where we just see the very end, TechCrunch coming out with an article, and we just get focused on, oh, I want that, yeah. you know, desire. Right. Like, we want things because other people want it. Um, but, and of you course, know, and your... of course those, 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 sorry to interrupt, but those are, oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. They only, please. They only talk about, they only talk about the, 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 the successful outcome. They don't talk about the hundred other, you know, stories that, that, that failed at the destination and, and where the destination didn't make it. So that's exactly yeah, it's, right. It's easy to and it's a moment in time, in right? Cause like you're absolutely right. I think a lot of, and you know, to your, to your point, it, to make this, to really bring this full circle, you mentioned that that once you reach that destination, a lot of times it's just a, it's 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 an event, it's a moment, and once it's gone, you're looking for the next thing. I know that you know over the year, over the decades, they've uh, trained astronauts who are getting ready, let's say, to go on a mission to space mm -hmm. and everything. That's a big, big event. They have to have some goals and things ready for them to Beyond put that. their mind to when they come back home, because if they yeah. don't, they 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 sink into depression because it's like, oh, like mm -hmm. all right, I went to space and. What's, right. what's, what's what else is there for me to do? What what could what could possibly be better than that? Right? It's yeah. It's yeah. It's I think it's a it's a big problem for for people that set their goals in that way and and don't focus on on kind of the quality of the journey. Yeah, so. the journey. I mean, because again, it's it's what you do every single day, and I think that really embracing the journey, the means, the means to the end, and not the end. I think that's really, in my experience, interviewing so many different people. The most successful people I've I realized they love the grind, they love the means, they love the journey, mm -hmm. you know. And I think I think I think that's really good advice for for the people listening is to focus on that. Yeah, so. and find people that you love to work with too. I mean, you you know you're on this journey with you know with other people, and so fi find people that you want to spend that time with. Yeah, I look. I, I hear you on that. Startup life is hard as it is. Um, doing it with people who are just duds not intellectually uh interesting or not you know my late mentor chris sells you may have worked mm. or, you, you may have known him he, he was over at at intuitive yeah. surgical yeah he says mm -hmm. so so sells great mentor I, he unfortunately he passed away actually just a couple of years ago yeah. um but he yeah. had this test he said um it's the detroit airport test sorry for everybody in detroit but you'll agree with me the detroit airport is not a fun place and he said mm. The Detroit airport test for startups is if you're stuck in, let's say in a blizzard in the Detroit airport for eight hours, would you, would you be happy to be stuck with this other person? If the answer mm -hmm. is yes, bring, bring them on board. They're part of the family. If the answer is no, probably not the right fit. <laughs> I think that's a pretty, pretty good heuristic, yeah. you know, yeah, I like that. It's, yeah, so, that's a good one. So I, I want to shift a little bit now, you know, to what you guys are doing at Hyperfine. So. Mm -hmm. Before I ask ask my questions and everything, what's the elevator pitch on on Hyperfine? What is Hyperfine? Yeah, so Hyperfine we we've developed a a bedside MRI platform that's portable. The mission of Hyperfine seven years ago when it first started was let's rethink MRI. So if you had a blank piece of paper. And you had these constraints that said it has to be on wheels, roll through a doorway, and plug into a normal wall outlet. How would you how would you build that? S same way that happened with let's take Tesla and the electric cars. You know, t Tesla didn't say, okay, let's start with a gas engine, and then maybe can we stick in a you know make it electric, and we'll come up with a hybrid. No, they said they said blank piece of paper. Let's start with first principles. You know, it's got to be all electric. It's got to have this range. Figure it out. And what that does is it forces the engineering and the, and, the, and, the, and the scientists to look at the problem completely differently. So, you know, MRI systems that are developed today by, the, you know, by the big players, um, high field MRIs, the, the physics is very different. There's a lot of very different physics involved compared to what we, what we had to do because we're using permanent magnets. Um, as opposed to superconducting magnets and, and, you know, a lot of, you know, those systems use a lot of power, a lot of electricity. Our system what is that, a normal wall What does that mean, permanent magnets versus, uh, versus the other Well, magnet. you know, what our magnets it? are, are, you know, our permanent magnets, like you'd find in a refrigerator magnet. Um, huh. You know, these systems are using electromagnets. So they're, you know, they're, they're putting electricity through coils to generate a magnetic field. Um, 
And so it just requires a lot more power. It's different physics. And then they're able, they, you know, they've committed themselves to a shielded room. Right. So it's like getting an MRI like is, is built. You got to build something. You got to build out a room or a wing for that. It's not just the technology. You, you, and, and they've committed themselves to that, meaning that that they don't have to then think about all of the problems that you would have to solve if you said, no, I don't have a shielded room. You know, I don't have a gas engine. Right. If you know, like, an, like a the car small company, hospital ASC. Right. They. They don't have they don't yeah. have and they don't have the money to say we're going to spend all this money on MRI and we're going to build something out, right? Right. The facility cost, the the you know building a concrete room and shielding. But if you said as an engineering team, you said you know what you know that's not an option. You don't you don't you don't get that out. You don't you're not allowed to build a concrete room and shielding. You need to figure out how to do this um, with you know putting this thing in a room and an IC a normal ICU or a normal emergency department where there's electrical equipment all over the place there's all kinds of electrical noise coming in how are you going to shield you know how are you going to eliminate that electrical noise from your from your image mm. and so it's just fundamentally different physics it's it's again back to the car example it's like saying you know take you know one company says okay i want an electric car but but you're still allowed to put a gas engine in it well you you're 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 not going to solve the range problems. You're not going to solve the battery problems that you would have to solve if you said, no, you don't get a gas engine. Start with a blank piece of paper and figure it out. And so that's what the team did. They, they, you know, they were given the hard constraints of it's got to roll through a doorway. It has to plug into a normal wall outlet. Um, and, and we want to be able to get, you know, good, high quality, clinically relevant images out of this thing. And so mm -hmm. that drove the team to really innovate and come up with some some new technologies new capabilities that allowed us to develop develop the first ever portable bedside mri that's amazing you know going back to the team that first worked on this you know if you can if you can talk about them a little bit but from a engineer's perspective i, I completely agree that to, to truly solve a problem in a new and different way not a better better is usually a byproduct but in a new and different way that is mm -hmm. actually going to you know quote unquote as the, our industry always says like challenge the status quo and shift paradigms. Yeah. You have to start with a blank piece of paper. How important is it to, for an engineer to be given like the right constraints? Cause I feel like those constraints where people hate them, if you learn to love them, that's where the magic usually is. It really is. I mean, you know, without constraints, um, there's always some kind of constraints. Sometimes the constraints are time. Right. So you have to have a solution and you get, you know, two years to do it. Well, you know, if you don't have enough time, you start, you know, finding solutions that are more readily available just so you can get something out. Um, and so if you're if you eliminate the con if you if you ease the constraint of time, but you put the constraint on around what would cr truly create a disruptive solution, which which the, t the team did seven years ago. Um, that, that is, it is, that is the, that is where the magic lies is because we're, you know, look, engineers, scientists, physicists, we can be incredibly creative and, and solve problems, um, that we think are impossible as you, as you alluded to earlier, you know, Lord Kelvin, uh, we go back to, um, the Wright brothers. Lord I, oh, Kelvin, I, I love where you're going now, right now. I love where you're going he, to this. Yes. <laughs> years. So a few, a handful of years before the Wright brothers flew, you know, did their first inaugural flight, Lord Kelvin, who was the, um, I believe he was like the head of the British, you know, Royal Science Society. Again, I'm botching that, but he was significant scientific figure at the time. He declared that there would never be a heavier than air flying machine ever. And then, you know, a few years later, the Wright brothers flew their first flight. So, you know, like you said, it's impossible until the, the day somebody does it. Um, Absolutely. And just, just to touch on that, because I, I think there's so much lost on how special the, that story is. Something that I, I often reference is that with the Wright brothers, what a lot of people don't realize is that you know, these guys were, of course, there wasn't really any, there was no such thing as aerospace engineering back then, but these guys were just bike yeah. mechanics, underfunded. They just did this out of their garage. And who they're competing against, who the guy, I, I forgot the guy's name, was extremely well-funded, uh, yeah. really, really prestigious scientists and everything. And these guys, these the Wright brothers, through again just determination, and I and I would I would I would even say that they they loved the process 
right? They crashed yeah. so many times, but they loved the process, you know? They love what they're doing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And there's something, there is something special in that, that idea of, 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 a cons, of cons, constrained resources. Um, you know, there's, you know, lots of examples of like that where, you know, teams with kind of, well, I mean, even big companies today, why do they, why do they fail to innovate? You know, innovators dilemma, um, you know, why, why do these companies sometimes fail to innovate or, or struggle to innovate? And, and um, some it's, it's in, there's many reasons, but part of it is, that, you know, that a lot, a lot of times they have kind of unconstrained resources and, and that, that doesn't force the creativity that, that the, you know, some constraints provide. Um, Absolutely. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting balance, you know, when you're running a company, you know, how much to ease up on those constraints, you know, how many headcount do you allow a team to have? Um, you know, it's, it's pretty well understood. Anybody who works in product development world really kind of gets the idea that the more people you add to a team, the slower things are going to go. And, and, and sometimes the worse they go. You know, I have a, a super strong philosophy that I really got exposed to it at intuitive at intuitive surgical, which was, you know, a small team of five, 10 really smart people can outperform a team of a hundred people any day. Um, I totally and, agree. And there's just, there's magic in that small, you know, seal team six approach of, of a bunch of smart people, a handful of smart people working on a very focused problem um, and committed and passionate to solving it can, can, can outperform a, a, a team with lots and lots of resources any day. I, I completely agree. And I think, I mean, for me, I, all I know is startups and the last 10 years, that's all I've done. And I, part of it, I mean, I've been asked, like, especially from a marketing standpoint, you know, marketing standpoint in a startup, you don't get a lot of budget. You, you, you're really bootstrapped. Um, and part of the thing I love it is that this pressure and constraints of like, you have this much money to fi and, and you got to figure out how do you 10 exit within like a few quarters or something about that. And even, I mean, just recently, you know, I'm, I'm launching, I've, I've launched my own, I guess, sort of entrepreneurial venture with my business. And, uh, there was a temptation a month ago, you know, my wife and I were expecting our first child this year and we're having a boy in May. So there was a, thank you. So there's this temptation. And one thing I would tell people, um, you can learn a lot from the world of internet, internet entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of these people, they, you know, didn't, didn't go to college. They're just self-taught street smart, very, very sharp. And one of the things I read, which is when you start your own business, especially if you're running low on money, there's a temptation to dip into, let's say your savings or some of your investments mm. to start paying. And I almost did that just to say, oh, let me just give myself a little cushion. And I read something mm. I, and I wish I remember the, who, who wrote this, that they said, don't do that because the moment you do, mm. you do that, you've removed the, a very powerful constraint which is mm -hmm. how are you going to make revenue as, as soon mm -hmm. as possible? And so a month ago, as scary as it was, I was like, all right, I'm just going to not do that. And lo and behold, that constraint and pressure forced me to prioritize things, forced me yeah. to move faster, to learn quickly from failures. And you know, the revenue took care of itself, but it was, if it was, yeah. if it, it was just because of that constraint, it sounds like it's so similar in the engineering and product world as well. I really, yeah, I think that's, I think you're right. There's something, there's something special about that. I mean, we, we, you know, Scott and I would always say pressure makes diamonds. Um, and so that's an example, right? When you take that pressure off or that constraint off and you have the freedom of, you know, you've got the money and you're not under pressure to, you know, hit some revenue targets for yourself. Uh, you just aren't forced to go through that, 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 that sort of a uh, crucible process. Mm -hmm. And it's a, maybe it's even a little bit of freaking out, uh, you, you but it gotta, for, forces yeah. you to, it forces you to think really hard. Like, man, I better get this together. I got to come up with something. And the human brain is, is incredible at solving problems. If it's, if it's, if it's really pushed, pushed to it. Absolutely. I mean, whether you believe in like God or the universe, you know, there is something to say that you have to, some, you know, you have to pass through the hell, the, the fires of hell before you get to the gates of heaven. And it's not meant to be easy. Otherwise everybody would do it. Right. Everybody you know? would do it. What was yeah. the hardest thing that you guys, like, what was, what was the thing when you guys were first starting that really was, was the thing that put the most pressure on you from an innovation standpoint? Because again, mm. for, for everyone listening and everybody knows massive MRI machines, massive rooms, you yeah. guys came up with one that 
is literally the size of the chair that I'm sitting on more or less, mm -hmm. and it's portable. That's really, really difficult to do from an engineering standpoint. Yeah. What, what was the constraint well, that really pushed you guys? Yeah, well, and I should, I should caveat this with, I was not there from the beginning, you know, I joined fairly recently. So, um, so I'm sort of relaying, I think this second hand, but I think there's a couple of things. It was the design of the magnets, right? So it was, it was getting that magnet design right so that the magnetic field was um, homogeneous or homogeneous enough. We're dealing mm -hmm. with the inhomogeneity of the magnetic field. Uh, and how do you deal with that? Um, and you can only get that design of the magnet structure, you know, only so good given all those constraints. Um, it was, was, I think, one big challenge. And then also just dealing with the environmental noise, right? So the electrical noise. So one of the big breakthroughs, and there's pat we have patents around this, is um, much like the, you know, Air, AirPods I'm wearing now, we have a noise canceling system. So we have multiple sensors all around the system that are picking up the environmental noise. And Interesting. We cancel that cancel that noise out of the out of the signal to eliminate it. Um, so we have a kind of a noise canceling. And that's real time, so, essentially real time. Is mm -hmm. yeah, wow. Yeah, it's taken out of, taken out of the image real time. So um, you know, so there's and there's uh, many other things. I mean, that's the you know that. It, Oftentimes there isn't one thing, you know, when you, when you design things from first principles, um, a lot of times it's not a, a single thing, but it's a whole bunch of things together. Again, a systems engineering problem. Absolutely. When you really look at the systems engineering problem holistically. I mean, I love, I just love the car examples again. You know, if you look at the car industry, it evolved to be very modular. Mm -hmm. So because of the supply chain, right? So they, the, the sophisticated supply chain developed. And, and, and simultaneously car designs became very modular, like, okay, we're going to design a, a radio module, you know, uh, slot and it's it got these dimensions and you, you write the specification and you give that to a bunch of supply chain, um, suppliers for radios and say, here, hit these, you know, hit these targets. The problem with that is that you no longer can innovate across that boundary. The, you can mm. no longer innovate across the boundary of the radio to the the rest of the car because you solve the problem within that area and well and you've made it modular and you and you've made the supply chain process easier you can make a whole lot of cars really fast and you can you know really cut your cost down but you can't innovate across the radio and the car about where that boundary is because you've you fixed it you've made it a fixed thing and you no longer have engineers and scientists thinking about oh how do we optimize this tesla came along and said forget the radio the way we you know forget knobs and air conditioners and all let's have just one big screen so they tore across the, they they ripped up the boundaries and the, that's another key area where innovation happens is if you can rip up the boundaries uh, uh, across system modules huh. and you can think of lots of examples of this so as soon as you tear up those boundaries and you look at it with a fresh piece of paper and you say, how do I innovate? Now, now, what did Tesla do? They said, okay, forget, we're not gonna use a supply chain that provides radios and a supply chain that provides, you know, air conditioning unit and a supply chain that provides this. We're gonna have a big screen and, you know, touch screen and all this, you know, software is going to do it. And they reinvented the whole user interface for, for a vehicle. And, and just compare that to a, any car you get in today, how awful you sit in that car, how awful is the user interface? Like you would never design like if you sat with a blank piece of paper, you would never design the user interface for your air conditioning and your radio and all the knobs and buttons to be that way if you design it from scratch. But it's evolved that way because of the modularity. And again, the modularity led to good things from a supply chain perspective and to be able to build cars at a low cost, but it, it killed the ability to innovate. And so, you know, for us uh, on the MRI platform, it was the same thing. We completely broke down any any boundaries. We, we, we really owned vertically owned apple does a great job of this right apple breaks down the boundaries across all of these these elements where they completely own vertically every you know now they own all the silicon right they make their and design their own silicon and, and so for our audience we should, we kind of glanced over that but you spent a number of years actually at apple before moving on to verb correct yeah yeah i mean i, I mean you know of course awesome awesome company um, loved it, loved the company, loved, loved the people there. And, but not and, enough constraints. Um, just, you, you have, you have unlimited resources there. It was not, know, hard, yeah, not hard enough for know, Dave Scott. 
I'll say this. I mean, it's a, such an interesting company. As big as they are, boy, they still understand and know how to how to innovate. Um, it's 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 they they've created a really interesting model. You know, because there's the design, the the evolution of a new product there comes from um, really focusing on creating an awesome user experience. It doesn't come from someone in 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 a marketing group doing a a market analysis and saying, "Hey, we should go build this product because it could generate a whole bunch of revenue." Yeah. It really comes from uh, a a perspective of of um, of even individuals kind of in a grassroots way, you know, engineers there and and from the design studio and people solving problems that they individually care about, like, "Oh, I'd really love to have you know this product in my home or this product," and they. And then they just um, take as long as it takes to make that the user experience awesome. So, you know, we haven't talked about that much. I mean, a lot of startup companies don't have that luxury, right? They don't have the luxury of, of time uh, and, and to, you know, many, many products and startup companies, they focus on solving the engineering problem first and then later on, tacking on how do I make a, a decent user experience out of it? Like user experience is often thought of secondary. Yeah. And, and, and those should be built with, at the same time, right? Well, you know, I mean, it, it's hard to say should, you know, every, every company is under different constraints. I mean, Apple has the luxury. They don't, they don't, you know, they can, they have, you know, such a successful business across their other businesses that they can take the time to say, let's, let's create an awesome, let's create a product that has an awesome user experience. Let's, you know, put the constraint on the engineering team, Hey, engineering team, the experience needs to look like this. Now go make it. So go make, go figure out the engineering to make it work like that. Mm -hmm. um, many companies do it. The, and, and, and even hyperfine, we did, you know, they did it the other way around. They solved the engineering problems first and then come back and look at, okay, now what's the user, how do we make the user experience good? And that's normal. I mean, early, I'm sure in the early days of Apple, it was the same way, you know, getting a, their first computers out. A lot of it was got to do what you got to do to get the product out. Um, but Steve Jobs definitely had a, an obsession with the user experience. And so that still is embedded in the culture there. And I think that's a key to their success. And, and you know, and I'm taking those learnings and I'm, I'm bringing it to Hyperfine. I mean, we're building the equivalent of a design studio within Hyperfine so that our you know, next generation, our current generation, next generation products can really be designed from how do we create an awesome user experience and then use that as a set of constraints to put on the engineering teams to go figure out how to make that happen and make that true. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and Steve Jobs had a you know, great saying, a thousand no's to every yes. So, you know, being very selective in, in what you actually spend your time and your resources on is, is, yeah. is another key for starting. So because he embedded important. that in the, in the culture at Apple, it, it, it maintains in some ways the, 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 the magic that startups have where they have these constraints on themselves. You know, Apple says no, forces, forces, focus, forces, you know, for as big of a company as they are, they do not have very many products. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, the, there's a magic in that, 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 that constraints that they put on themselves uh, in terms of what they're going to launch and what they're going to put energy towards. And, you know, a lot of companies that that much money would be going after, you know, all kinds of different things and kind of spread out all over the place, but Apple doesn't do that. And you, you, you set up a nice segue for me. Um, like with regards to having, because uh, discipline, I think is just so important. I mean, we can look at all kinds of stars, but just from your from your uh, history, you look at Intuitive, really impressive robot, great. And back in the early two thousands, oh, they wanted to do everything: cardiac surgery, this surgery, I don't know what. And what made Intuitive Intuitive, which was a five dollar stock to you know a thousand dollar per you know uh, a stock that got a hundred billion dollar company, a hundred billion dollar company, is that they said. We're not doing any, we're going to focus on owning radical yeah. prostatectomy. That is it. And I look at Hyperfine and again, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I got to give credit where credit is due. You're designing a, a new category. You started with a blank piece of paper and it's very clear just from looking at the technology that someone said, how can we do this completely different and new? And the byproduct of course is going to be better because if you just started with better, you're just going to improve on the existing models, yeah. but any company. Incremental, exactly. But any company from a commercial standpoint, they have a product like Hyperfine. You have 
you know, um, bedside MRI, commercially, oh, we can sell to everybody. We should sell to the orthopedic department, this department, neurosurgery. Um, you can look at, you know, like, acute, you know, I saw you had Barbara McLean on, very, you know, very well respected uh, a, a clinician in the ICU world. You can do mental status mm -hmm. changes at the ICU. But you guys decided to focus specifically on the neuro aspect, right? And, and around stroke. Mm -hmm. Why there? Because that's that to me when I saw that, and that's why I wanted to interview. I was like, that took a lot of commercial discipline, because mm -hmm. most other people would have said, "Let's put let's put this in physical therapy and orthopedics, huge market, yeah. lots of money, etc." So mm -hmm. why did you guys do that to yourself? Why did you impose well, that mean, constraint? You know, and of course we looked at. I mean, we looked at all of that. We looked at you know orthopedic applications, you know, out, you know, out, out, uh, satellite clinic applications. Um, all kinds of, of, you know, yeah, because there's this plethora of choices. Um, and what, what we've done over the last six months is really looked at what, what, what is the, pro the product good at? What is, there, what, is its really, what is it really, really strong at? What is it really good at? And where is the, you know, the market fit for that and the market opportunity? And there's a there's a few things. I mean, we're we are focused, but we're we're focused on a handful of things. But they're 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 very synergistic with each other, and they're, they're all neuro, they're all brain based. One focus area. I mean, stroke is stroke is one of them, but another focus area for for us, and it's because of the clinical value uh, proposition of this is hydrocephalus in children. It's not mm -hmm. a huge huge market. Rather small hydrocephalus in, in children. children. Yeah, but it's but but it, but it's not but it's not the whole market we're going off after either. But it's a it's a great place to uh, to gain a football hold because again, when you're when you're small and you're first starting out, all of these markets are are good and big because you've got lots of early adopters who will, who want to who want to jump in. So you have to pick where you're going to go and where you're going to add the most clinical value. And and let's talk about hydrocephalus in kids. So as you probably know. You know, this is a, a brain condition where children or even adults, they can get pressure in the brain, it creates swelling, and um, and it is, can be, you know, fatal if not not treated or dealt with. But one of the treatments is to, um, they put in, they drill a hole in the skull, and they put in a tube, a drainage tube, and they dr and then they run that drainage tube underneath the skin and to, the, to their belly. And so they're draining the, flu it's, a, it's basically a different, create a different pathway so for that fluid to drain. Because that's what's happening is the fluid isn't moving um, and draining out of the brain, and so this uh, drainage tube can get, become clogged. So imagine you have a three-year-old kid, um, you're a parent, and well, you're about you're about to be. So you know, imagine you know, imagine you have a, a child, a uh, young child, and has to go through this procedure. You're first of all, that's just an awful thing as a parent to have to go through. Mm -hmm. and I can't imagine. But then you know, uh, you know, six months later, the child wakes up with a headache. You don't know what's wrong. You don't know whether they have a headache just because they ate some, you know, too much candy, or or because there's something wrong with their shunt that's in their head. You're freaked out. You bring them into, um, uh, you know, an emergency room or, or wherever your local center is. And th today, what they do is they Im they're imaging those kids. Many of those kids are getting imaged with CT, with radiation, with mm -hmm. X-rays. Because they don't have access to MRI, the MRI suite is already booked up, or it's too hard to get access to. And MRI would be the you know preferred approach. And then the problem is, especially in children, many of these kids are getting anywhere from twenty to fifty CT scans by the time they turn eighteen. A lot of radiation. And now there's a, a lot of radiation, and there's a lot of data now that's coming out that, that a huge percentage of these kids are 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 um, ending up with brain tumors. Yeah. So you know. For from a clinical value and from a, a mission standpoint for Hyperfine, eliminating CT for imaging these kids is is a huge benefit to to these kids and to and to, and to uh, into the healthcare system. You know, there's no reason we should be doing that when we have a portable bedside MRI that can be used in a clinic or in an emergency department. And you bring your kid in, mom can be right there holding the kid's hand and feel comfortable knowing that that kid isn't getting radiation, but they're getting a perfectly safe MRI scan. So that's an area that we're, that we are focusing on. Um, it's a, it's a great market. It has, it, it's a worldwide market The you know, hydro problem in hydrocephalus is, is worldwide and it's bigger. Very bad in the third in world, the especially, right? 
And yes, in, in developing countries, it's a huge problem. Uh, we're, you know, we have a great partnership with the Gates Foundation. So this is one of the things that, that you know, they look at and are interested in. Um, and so it, it's, it's a great place for us to establish a foothold. Um, you know, just like prostatectomy for intuitive is not the, it's not the biggest surgical procedure. Um, it's a, it's a decent sized surgical procedure, but it has huge clinical value. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the downsides of a of a prostatectomy going going wrong are, are dramatically bad. Right. Incontinence, um, sexual lack of sexual function. Um, and and so, you know, it made it just it just was uh, a, a lot of sense for intuitive to go after that because of of the clinical value that that could provide. Gain a foothold there, prove the value proposition and then expand from that beachhead. And so stroke. Uh. Stroke is a huge, huge, you know, market, right? And we, it is, it is a focus for us, and it's going to be a slower adoption curve in that space um, because uh, for for a number of reasons of the dynamics of how that market works. Um, but we uh, we are uh, launching in the stroke. We're working with some key centers uh, who are doing our early clinical validation work. Um, in, in stroke, we're partnering with them and we're excited about that. And we're rolling out software uh, software upgrades and software improvements and, and software features to uh, aid in the workflow, in the stroke workflow. So once we put all of those, those pieces together to create that whole product solution, um, we, we, we hope to just knock it out of the park and stroke. And of course, you know, stro stroke's a huge, huge market, especially in the US. And that's fantastic because, you know, uh, as opposed to, and again, you know, to be fair, you know, taking a medical device to market is really hard. It's not like a, you know, it's not like SaaS where you just update mm -hmm. something and you just put it up out there. It, yep. It's a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. And so granted, I, I get, you know, a lot of founders are under pressure to get commercial traction, but it's almost like putting the constraint and discipline of saying, and again, I'm, I'm talking tomorrow. So we gotta, we gotta give, pay homage to, to Jeff Moore's work picking a beachhead, mm -hmm. just being disciplined and picking a beachhead. Because even through that, and the, even the venture capital community, when I talked to them, they mentioned that when they look at startups, and this is this is non-med device, they're looking for what, what segment of the market are they gonna own so they can engineer and architect that word of mouth at scale. And if yeah. you don't pick a beachhead and you become, you, you, you know, you sell over here, there, et cetera, rather yeah. than being a meaningful specific with a tribe of, of, of early yeah. adopters who are going to amplify this new different mm -hmm. way, you've become a wandering generality for like these people there, there's people. and then people wonder why is it taking yeah. so long to adopt? That's why. Yeah. And, and it's confusing for your sales force. I mean, if you, if you have to do it, oh, absolutely. Sales, then you're, you absolutely. know, your sales force is, is not, not focused. They don't have the right, um, you know, marketing materials and sales materials they need. They don't have the right messaging. Uh, they don't know who to call on. So, it, you know, focus is, is everything. And it, it's also really easy to say focus, right? I mean, many startup companies have a great product and, and then they have so many options and, you know, it's not easy to know which one's the right one. I mean, look, I mean, again, if you use the intuitive example, they, they were initially going after cardiac and there's a lot of good reasons to do that. And, you know, at, with hindsight, there's a lot of reasons not to do cardiac first. Um, but hindsight's 2020 and, and um, it was only after, you know, Henry Ford Hospital published the paper and showed the first 100 patients uh, for prostatectomy and the great results they had that, that they, they were able to really ex explode with that as the beachhead. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it's, not, it's not easy. And, and, you know, intuitive, I don't know how many, you know, several years, I think they kind of were, were, took them to kind of figure that out. Um, I think we've, we've uh, you know, we've had we have the benefit of, of my experience from uh, several different startups and from Intuitive and others. I uh, hired um, my chief commercial officer comes from Intuitive Surgical, so he he knows the playbook. He knows how to go out and create a brand Who, new category, a brand who's new market. Your, who's your chief commercial officer? A guy named Scott White. I I don't personally know him. I know of him. That's that's a great hire. I love this industry so much that I look at hires kind of like people watch like fantasy football and everything. This person's being traded mm -hmm. over here, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great yeah. hire. Absolutely. Uh, hundred percent. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, 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 when I was recruiting for him, I, you know, I, I talked to the recruiting team about it and I said, look, you know, I'd like to get someone from intuitive because it's kind of like knowing 
it's like knowing where somebody, you know, it's like knowing somebody got their PhD from MIT, you know, it, it, it's a it, culture it, thing. And it, it's, right. I know how he was trained. I know how, you know, I know that, that he's got the playbook that I, that I was looking for because it, you know, this is, you started out, right. We're trying to create a brand new category. Uh, and when that is a very different type of sales approach than than say uh, going out and competing against an exist in, a, in an existing category, uh -huh. you know, you're trying to create a market that does not exist. Um, hospitals don't understand putting an MRI machine in the IC or in the emergency department. They don't understand it. Or um, why would so why the would work, they want to even do that? They spend all this money on, on a wing. Why would you want to do that? Right. So that, so it takes, you just first have to help them wrap their head around that. And and then, so, you know, we're finding in the, in the sales process, cl clinically physicians love, love, love what we're doing. They get it immediately. The value proposition. Oh yeah. Bedside. To be MRI. clear, when you say clinicians, which, what type of clinicians? You know, you know, these are the, you know, neurosurgeons, the ICU physician, the physicians that are in the ICU, the the um, neuro ICU physicians, the emergency department doctors um, versus, let's say, the radiology radiologists who aren't touching the patient directly. Mm -hmm. um, and and these people uh, get it because they they face they are the ones dealing with the patient who is very. Let's take an I let me let's go into a specific example. Let's take an ICU patient who's very, very sick. They're in the ICU for a reason. Um, they're unstable, they're on a ventilator, they're hooked up to all kinds of drip lines. And there's some kind of what's called acute mental status change, right? They're, they're, right. They um, aren't responding um, and there's some concern that maybe they've had a stroke or some other bleed. Maybe they went septic, the, you, you don't know. There's maybe all kinds of reasons, You don't right? know what's wrong. And so they're, they're, there's a motivation to give, get them an MRI scan. So the process is that the nursing staff has to pack up this patient for transport. Which is a lot um, and, of stuff for people who are not in, 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 in the ICU. A lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff, especially if these people are on it, you know, if they're on a ventilator, um, maybe you, you might have, you may have to have a whole team of people to help transport this patient. So you got to pack this patient up, transport them. If you're lucky, the MRI is in the same building. So you only have to take an elevator ride. If you're not lucky, maybe it's across campus. It's like in, in, in another even, zip code. <laughs> Or even worse, yeah, you got to put them in an ambulance and you got to send them across town or, or even farther. So, right. um, and then once you get them to the MRI suite, you have to convert them over to M being MRI compatible, meaning all of the metal. Mm -hmm. If there's any, if any of the equipment is has any kind of iron, you know, magnetic um, uh, ferrous metal in it, um, you have to take that stuff out, right? So, like oxygen tank, you have to replace with with carbon fiber oxygen tanks. Um, and so there's, you have to, th this whole swap over process again, and, and you know, tremendous amount of time and resources to do that. Finally, you can get them in, do the imaging, and then you got to reverse all that. And not to mention, and, I was going to say like with the patient, a lot of these people are, are, these are the most delicate, like high risk mm -hmm. patients in the entire hospital. Yeah. Say somebody who's like into their eighties or something, they're, they're literally hanging on yeah. by a thread. So the amount of stress yeah. that you put that person yeah. through their body mentally and physically yeah. to transfer them and you're trying to just, you know, keep, keep them going. Yeah. Right. Not to mention the cost, we, the, the hours, et cetera, so, uh, you know, to your point, you know, we did a survey of kind of the literature. There's some publications on, on this and there's a range, the, the papers range anywhere from 20% to almost 50% uh, of the time there's an adverse event. And, and we, we think that's highly underreported. And an adverse event, you know, you can imagine, I mean, you're, they're being transported, a line gets unplugged accidentally, uh, all kinds of problems. No, no, one, they're, they're no one has fragile. time to record that stuff. You know? No one has time. So they're, they're, these are fragile patients, to your point. So back, you know, back to the, the, the story. So imagine that in contrast to a bedside MRI. We can roll our system in, roll it right. They don't have to leave their ICU bed. We roll it right up to their bed. We can put them into the system with intubation tubes and all of that tubing still connected. Do that brain scan right there. The data we have shows that from at one site, it was 26 hours in the end for the traditional MRI because of that long pathway I just described. In our system, it was 90 minutes. 
and 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 the imaging time is not ninety minutes. The, the the ninety minutes includes going finding the scanner, bring it to the room, you know, all of that. The imaging time is only about twenty minutes, um, and so it's just drastically safer for the patient, faster because you're getting the diagnosis faster. So it's better for the you know the 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 physicians who want to get a, a diagnostic answer. The nursing staff love it because they don't want to they don't want to transport that patient. They know how unsafe it is and it's a big hassle for them. And, uh, and then it's a cost savings for the hospital system because of the reduction in adverse events. So, you know, it's an interesting um, thing. When I was first looking at Hyperfine and I was comparing this to intuitive surgical and, and kind of my experience there, um, you, you know, you look at you look at these different stakeholders for any medic in the medical device world. Like I look at stakeholder benefits. Right. So mm-hmm. and, and you kind of go down the line. So there's the patient patient value, the physician value the staff, the nursing staff value, the hospital value, which is tip, usually around ROI, but, you know, money. Um, and, and are you able to create value for all, all of the people in that, in that value chain? And with intuitive, um, you know, they're, they're, they're creating good patient value. In the early days, it was, you know, the data was a little, little weak and they struggled to kind of collect the data. I think they're building that, that, that validation data much more now. Um, physicians though loved it. So physicians loved the, the, uh, the platform, uh, you know, in the early days, the, the nursing staff weren't crazy about it. You know, it was harder mm-hmm. to set up a Da Vinci than it was to do a just a stand, a standard surgical procedure. So, you and know, that makes the adoption staff, hard, right? Made the adoption hard. Now I think they've, they've done, gone a long way to helping nursing staff kind of um, become champions for it. But in the early days, they, they struggled with that because they hadn't really solve that problem yet and and to be and again maybe i'm wrong i I think Mm -hmm. intuitive is i think any other company in intuitive's situation back then in the 2000s we would have done the same but back then you didn't have to worry about that you show it to a surgeon they say yep i want the hospital buys it but today nurses are extremely important they you know it's not often that a nurse or, or the nurse committee says we want this technology but i'll tell you what they're definitely the ones that'll stop a technology from being adopted and so it's so important yeah. to take take that into account versus totally. you can't just get a surgeon excited about something and not take into account. Again, I think this goes back to what you mentioned earlier, which is the actual user experience. Yeah. Well, and 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 yes, and and you know, in the early days, they could get they could get a surgeon to 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 push through a purchase of a system, but if the nursing staff wasn't on board, that would really kill the kill the utilization of that system within that hospital center. So you really need. The entire hospital, all of these players to be on board, the physicians, the nursing staff, and that's true for for us as well. You know, when we when we sell a system in, we've put together a whole customer success program. We call it Hyper Week, and we go I, in. I love and, the, I love the I love the branding yeah. around that. I like that. Yeah. Hyper Week. Hyper what does week. Hyper Week hyper look week. like? Yeah. So oh, I, it's, so we I, our hospital just buys Hyperfine. What does Hyper Week mm-hmm. look like for me as a, as as a, as a clinician? So we really try to bring in all of the stakeholders. So we, you know, those cl- those clinical physicians that you know, whether let's say it's the ICU. So we want to train everybody who is, you know, in the ICU as a physician that's going to ever interact with our our platform. Um, you know, if you miss even if you miss one person, then that's going to create a breakdown at some point in the process. We we also want to train the nursing staff. We want to train the uh, even the administrators so that they're aware from a from a like a reimbursement and and, and a processing perspective financially. So we bring to, all these people say, together. Yeah. Not to not to interrupt, just to because I know that uh, this will be going up on YouTube. So for the audience listening, I'll leave the links in the comments. But um, let me share my screen, you know, because I I can share the you know because you have the site readiness and so this is this is kind of the checklist for like what hyper week looks like right oh yeah yeah you found it yeah yeah so and you know this is this is again i mean I, i'll give all the credit to intuitive i mean this is something i borrowed from the intuitive playbook is you know what they really learned was you can't just go and sell a system and then and then leave drop it off and run to the next hospital exactly. and sell another one you you need to and and, and intuitive really mastered this of putting together a really extensive training program, not just for the doctor that's doing the surgery, but everybody in the, in the whole, you know, ecosystem of, of around that robot and, and really create help, help the hospital and all the individuals create a feeling of ownership and accountability for the success of, of that platform there. And we're trying to do the same thing. I'm borrowing from their playbook, you know, where we go no, in week. 
Yeah, and that's what well, it takes. Because look, it, it, back to the my point earlier, the physicians love it. It's it, our battle is the behavior change. Behavior change is the hard, because we're trying to create a new category. So the value proposition is is awesome. It's it's human behavior change, right? So inside these hospitals, they're not used to having an MRI in the ICU, so they don't have a workflow. They don't. They don't. You know, their 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 systems are set up for the workflow of a, a MRI system that's in the basement of the building. And, right. and that's a very different workflow. So when you ask them and you say, hey, you're going to roll this down the hallway and roll it up to the patient bedside, you know, they say, well, who, who's going to do that? We, we, who does that? Like, because that, that's a new workflow. No one's never exactly. done that before. And the hospital does so not they, have the time or energy or money to figure that out. And the, the staff that are there, they're not paid enough to care about doing that. I think exactly. a lot of med device I mean, companies expect like, oh, if we sell this expensive thing, the hospital will figure it out. And that's yeah. not true. You know, and, and, you know, and this is key for any, you know, any new startup or, you know, entrepreneur. I mean, it's one thing to create a great product that creates a great value proposition, but there's so many elements to the puzzle that you have to solve. You know, reimbursement is key. FDA approvals is key, but, but this, this issue is, is often underlooked. And that is, is just overall user. It gets back to the Apple, right? Apple experiences, overall user experience. So, you know, when you put that system there, what does it take for that to truly be adopted and really understand the workflow um, from end to end? From you know, where is that system? You know, where is that system stored? Is it stored in the hallway? Is it stored uh, in a in a closet somewhere? Um, who's going to walk down the hallway and get it and move it? Who's going to load the patient? Who's going to push? You know, set the system up and push the scan button. Who's going to unload the? You know, every step of that process has to be broken down. There has to be clear accountability with who's going to, you know, be the person. And and you can't just train one person because there's shifts, right? So yeah. we, we, saw an quit. we saw an example where people quit. So we saw an example where we were having great utilization at this site, but we were noticing that on Tuesdays, Thursdays, it like the utilization went to zero. We found out, we found out that it was because one of the nursing staff didn't get trained and this person felt really insecure because they didn't get the training. So they didn't understand, they felt insecure. And so they were making excuses about uh, why they weren't going to, um, you know, bring the system in for use. And, and so the system wasn't getting utilized. It was an interesting case. So we got it, we went in there, got that person trained. And, and, and you and bumped up your utilization. And, yeah, and I, gotta, I, I gotta point something out because, you know, for me, I built my career in surgical robotics and a lot of the playbooks that you and I got trained on, like I've taken and, you know, improved on it, but like from the surgical robotics standpoint, you know, again, not enough to sell capital equipment and just drop it off and expect it to be used. The worst thing that can happen, you have a blowout quarter and you, you play systems, you know, all over a region, but then two or three quarters later, if you don't figure out how to um, train and empower the staff and the surgeons, your realization's at 50% and that, and these hospitals talk to each other. I they think the, the, other, yeah. the bad thing that happened in the early days of surgical robotics, and I, I, I personally feel the reason why surgical robotics didn't penetrate as much as it should, salespeople, no offense to them, they didn't know any better back then, just sold robots wherever they could, didn't focus on yep. utilization, and surgeons talked to each other like, oh, how do you like this robot? That, ah, yep. you know, we, we, we use it from time to time. Oh, we got a closet full of them. Just kill, yeah, killed the market better, and, and hurt a bunch of companies. Yeah. Yeah, I got a bad reputation and, you know, an intuitive hadn't hadn't figured out the, the, the workflow formula yet. Um, but you're exactly right. And, and um, you know, even Hyperfine made that mistake in the early days with uh, placing systems without really um, uh, training the staff properly. I think a lot of companies, especially if you're creating a new category where, where there isn't an existing workflow to, to slot into, Mm -hmm. um, it's an easy mistake to make to think, oh, my, my product is so good, people will just use it. And it just doesn't exist. Yeah. And they completely underestimate the the the, the challenge of, of behavior change. And and just again, like to to challenge to challenge uh, something because I know, believe me, there's there's plenty of of of, of med tech companies that they have a pretty easy, intuitive product to use. Even so, don't you want to own that experience where? your company is actually doing the training and, and that, that staff, they're like, I love XYZ company because 
for me, great med tech companies, they're similar in a sense, kind of like, like Nike. Nike celebrates great athletes. I feel like great med tech companies find ways to celebrate clinicians. And these clinicians are, you know, they're the heroes. So if you find a way not only to empower them with technology, but again, change the workflow, you, 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 that's how you, how you really change medicine. I mean, uh, my, one of my favorite, uh, success stories, uh, you, you, you had mentioned, you, did you spend time at MIT or, or, or is that, no, no, that's no, just in my, head. you example. use that as an example. So, well, out of MIT, you have one of the most, more successful, uh, marketing companies, which is HubSpot, it's, you know, 20, 30, $40 billion market cap, amazing marketing software. There's thousands of automation, marketing automation companies out there. Why did HubSpot become like that big? Because in the earlier days, I didn't learn about their technology until later on. They did a lot to make me better as a marketer, improving my process, my workflow, educating me, making me more efficient in my job, right? And then that, of course, increased my utilization of the technology. And I think that's what you guys are doing here at Hypermind. I think there's so many founders who are listening to this. They need to go back and just replay everything that you just you just talked about. I think mm -hmm. it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of just, there's so many elements to it. You know, um, how do you create for, I mean, first you gotta, first you gotta create a product. I mean, I mean, it's, it, it has to be, it has to be a, a product that's truly solving a, 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 an important problem. And then, and then really, again, taking a cue out of the app, out of the Apple playbook, which is now look, now you got to look really hard at the overall experience. And if the experience isn't good, it doesn't matter how good the product solves the problem. If it doesn't, if, it, if the experience is a good, to your point about it, the nursing staff, if they don't like using it. If it's a pain to use, even though uh -huh. it might give you great images, they're going to they're gonna find ways to fight against it and not use it. A hundred percent. I think a lot of what you talk about is, is essentially design thinking principles and first mm -hmm. principles, which is asking is. these que like simple questions like, who's actually going to roll this thing out? Who's going to touch it? Yeah. Who's going to interact with it? Um, and, you know, again, uh, there's so many people in this industry that they say, oh, we're in the business of behavior change. Part of behavior change is that no matter how great it is, how much better it is, if it's a little bit too painful, if it's too uncomfortable, yeah. it's a little too complicated, doesn't matter how great it is, people are not going to do it. Period. Yeah, because it's too, it's too easy to just go back to the way you always do things. It's it, you know you got a lot of a, you got a lot of other things in your day that you want to put your time on. You don't want to like learn a new trick. So exactly. Look, every look everybody everybody knows if you want to be healthy, it's you know you just have to work out every day. There's a reason yeah. why people don't do that, even though they know like I should probably do it. Too complicated, too painful, too 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 much to do. You know. Yeah. And I think that's exactly there, right. I think you know there's a and and. Again, I, I want to be mindful of your time. We've been on for for a while. I could keep going, but I, I know I, we got to wrap up because you're mm -hmm. you got a you got a company to run, so we'll, we'll get into mm -hmm. um, into uh, the rapid rapid question fire uh, rapid fire questions. But I, I wanted to just uh, share something with you, you know, with you and the audience. You know, one of the internet entrepreneurs who, uh, you know, again, somebody whose book a lot of people wouldn't even pick up because they it wasn't published by like a Harvard Business Review, etc. Is Alex Formosi mm -hmm. who did this huge uh, company around launching gyms, right? Gym, mm -hmm. gym startups. And he has this equation around value where on the, on the uh, numerator above, you know, you have yeah. the dream outcome and you multiply that by the perceived likelihood of achievement. So your dream outcome could be like losing weight. And yeah. how likely do you think that's going to happen? The mm -hmm. best companies in the world, he says, focus on the denominator, which is, What's the level of effort that I'm going to have to put into doing this and the amount of sacrifice? Mm -hmm. And the ones that get that to zero are the ones that become billion-dollar unicorns. And it's a great example. I mean, look in our industry. Look, working out, you can put that you know formula in there, but the effort mm -hmm. and sacrifice is high versus cool sculpting, mm -hmm. you know, freezing off fat. Effort mm -hmm. and sacrifice is zero. So there's a reason why that, mm -hmm. that company made billions and billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think thinking about it the way you guys are, are doing it at Hyperfine, it's just going to be yeah. so exciting to watch uh, you create, you know, a new category, and more importantly, truly, truly create a new standard of care. You know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you brought up that equation. I mean, we, you know, intuitive. Again, I'll, I'll use. I, I, I shamelessly borrow things from their playbook. Um, you, you borrow, know, and you make equation. it better, though. Uh, well, I, you know, apply it to something new. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, they. Um, they have an equation for patient value. So patient value huh. is uh, equal to, um, 
Oh my goodness. Now I'm, now I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on it. Oh, you can't um, leave us hanging like that. Yeah. Take, take your time. It, it, it's, um, efficacy divided by invasiveness squared. Hmm. So, you know, how effective is the procedure and how, and how non-invasive is it? Right. And I kind of borrowed that from their playbook and I said the same thing and to, to play off of what you were saying, it's very similar. It, it, my, the equation I kind of came up with hyperfine is, you know, it's, it's image quality divided by friction. So to, mm. to what you were describing, right, is, you know, you called, I think you called it, what did you call it? Effort. Effort. Um, mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the denominator. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so image quality has got to be there, right? I mean, you've got to have enough image quality. But if we can dr drive friction down, right, to zero, then to your point, that, that just drives utilization through the roof. It drives patient value through the roof. And so we're focusing on, you know, we can't, you know, you've got to have image quality can't be zero because then you have no patient value. So image quality has to be there, right? You have to hit a certain threshold in your image quality uh, to be good enough. But if their friction is too high, then you don't have patient value. But if you can drive the friction down, the denominator down, then you can drive patient value up. And so it's it's plays into this whole conversation of, we're really focusing on both of those elements, continuing to improve image quality while we drive the user experience to be great or, you know, the friction to be very low and make it easier and easier to use across the board for, for physicians and nursing staff. And, you know, we have a commitment to be at the hospital level, just the easiest company to work with. And we're, we're working on how do we streamline our contracting process? So we're mm. really trying to drive our friction down. Um, across the board, not just on the on the product side, but the, as a business. And as I say, pun pun intended, you want to be you know you want to be hyper fine, <laughs> hyper fine, hyper hyper easy, hyper hyper uh, effective, and hyper hyper awesome. <laughs> to work I love with. it. Well, yeah. you know, they, this, this has been so much fun. You're definitely going to be a repeat guest, and and I'm going to take you up. You know, fly out here to SoCal. Cool. We we should do it in person. Joe Rogan style, you know, some drinks to talk about innovation, the future, wherever, wherever that goes. But just to kind of wrap up, we're going to do some rapid fire question again. I'm good on time. So you can take as long as you want to answer these or as quickly as you want. I'm going to do about okay. four, f three or four of these questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first one's an easy one. Well, sometimes uh, during the pandemic from 2020 till now, you know, we ordered a lot of stuff. We Amazon primed a lot of things for ourselves, mm -hmm. books, gadgets, etc. What's the coolest thing that you bought for under $200? Oh man, under two hundred dollars! Wow, I was I had my answer ready to go, but it's more than two hundred dollars. My over two hundred dollars answer is a gravel. Yeah, bike. let's see. I, I, is, I is got it what? In, I got in a, a gravel bike. A so gravel? It's a, what's a gravel it's bike? A, it's you'll have to Google it. It's a cross between a road bike and a and a mountain bike. So it has oh, with the like really big these, tires, right? It has like mountain bike tires, but it's on a kind of like a road a, a very you know, beefy road bike frame. So it's, okay. it's just super fun, super fun to take out and, you know, trails and things like that. So that, that was my sort of splurge, uh, and, and, and hobby during, during COVID, but under $200. Wow. Um, gosh, I'd have, you know, I'd have to really think about that one. Um, books are included. I'd, it could be gadgets I'd or have books. To, I'd have to say, uh, ordering, ordering out Uber, Uber, you know, eats and, or, um, ordering out through caviar a lot was, got it. <laughs> was my $200. We'll surge. accept it. We'll my accept son that. would, my son would order, and this is a little embarrassing, but you know, if we weren't, if I wasn't there to monitor him, he would order like a Chipotle burrito to be delivered, you know, to the house <laughs> and, you know, you know, you, you know, a, a, you know, a $8 burrito ends up costing you $25 after the delivery. So that was, uh, I'd have to crack down on him for that sometime. <laughs> Those bills can run up quicker. Absolutely. All right. So that's, <laughs> that's your, that's your Amazon. Next question. Uh, continuing education is, is a big part of medicine. You know, we, we see that with mm -hmm. our, with the clinicians we work with and very much in the business world as well. What book do you feel that you end up recommending or gifting to people most often? It could be, it doesn't have to be in medicine. It doesn't have to be mm. in tech. It could be any book. What do you feel oh, wow. like you recommend and gift more often? Well, from a business perspective, I, I, you know, a lot of times you, you, people give you books or you, if you recommend books that are just too heavy of a read, they never read them. 
Um, mm-hmm. But I find there's a great easy read that is has the most p- packs the most punch uh, that it honestly should be taught in school is five dysfunctions of a team um, because it's uh-huh. it's all about teamwork. Um, you know, you can accomplish you know so much more with great teamwork than you can alone. And I think that's something else that's often lost on entrepreneurs. You know, these are, you know, young, I mean, look, education's a little bit broken in this way. We, you know, our education system is teaching kids to be these individuals and perform individually, you know, get an A, get an A in all your classes. And you work so hard to perform individually. And then all of a sudden you're thrown into this world where it's all about collaborating. And then, but kids Mm -hmm. don't really know how to collaborate. Now, I think that's starting to change. I mean, I see my kids going through school and there's a lot more collaborative type class class uh, teaching. But, um, you know, five dysfunctions of a team really teaches the fundamentals of what it takes to, to, to operate as a great team. And it's all based on a foundation of trust. I love that. And I completely agree. And I think, you know, again, especially here in the Western world, you know, very individual folks, focus on everything, which is, you know, has pros and cons to it. But especially today, more than any time, and I think the pandemic really showed that, we're globally, we're connected a lot more than we think. I know that, um, you know, I have different opinions about our current uh, trade situation with China. We have to find a way to make that work, you know, um, mm-hmm. somehow it's it, the, 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 the world is a lot smaller than it used to be. And I think that's a very, very good point. A very valid one. Um, have you okay. read that book? Have you read that book, by the way? Many, many years ago, because yeah. My, my the the late great Chris Sells that was one of the books he told me I need to read I read it but when I read it I think I was too young to appreciate what it had but now that you mm-hmm. mentioned it I'm going to uh, reorder it behind me I have this uh, my, my pride and joy uh, uh, of of the possessions I have is my library so I'm going to get that book and actually I'll review that on my show so and the, and, and his newer one is um is uh the advantage it's called the advantage oh okay. All right. And the other the other book I would I would recommend, especially especially for young entrepreneurs, is have you read uh, Breathe yet? Uh, is is that's by a physician, isn't it? Oh gosh, no. I mean, wait, wait. It's by it's by uh, uh, Rickson Gracie, right? Um, let me see. Hold let me on. just look it up. I forget who the author is now. Um, is there a guy? Is it black and white with a guy sitting? It is, uh, it's, yeah, James Nestor. No, I have not read that. I read, uh, there's another one called Breathe, which is by one of the Gracies. I'm into jujitsu, so I, I read that one. That was amazing. I have not read Breathe by Nestor, so I'm ordering that right now. Tell, tell us mm-hmm. about Breathe. Why, why Breathe? Well, he, it, it's, it's just a great analysis of like the data around the, the, the benefit. The, the right way to breathe and the benefits of breathing correctly and how we've evolved to breathe through our, our mouths instead of through our, our nose. And people's and uh, mouths, jaw structure are, are, are reducing. Right. Yes. And, and our jaws have, have been changing for various reasons that actually hinder our abilities to breathe properly. And so improper breathing leads to all kinds of health, uh, you know, detrimental health issues. And so, you know, if you're an entrepreneur starting a company, you're under a lot of stress, uh, learning how to breathe properly and, and using it as a, as a, as a method for um, um, just, uh, you know, ma- yeah, I guess managing the, managing the stress and just generally being, being a healthier. It's, it's a fascinating read. I'm, I'm definitely getting that. Um, I'm a big fan of, of meditation and breath work. I, I've been doing Wim Hof, you know, or essentially ice cold showers yeah. and baths yeah. for, I think since 2015, so oh. breathing is a big part. When you come out here, when we sit down and do that, do that uh, talk, what we're going to do is we'll have some scotch talk, and then we're yeah. going to take a take a dip in like 30 degree ice bath. Oh, I, get I out! I love it. Let's. I, we're we're going to do it. This is all. You know, this is all being recorded. You you have you have officially signed up for for these things. The audience <laughs> has heard you, so you got to deliver. Awesome. So we're gonna we're hold you right. to it. I love it. Well, awesome. If you've, got, if you've got an ice bath, I'm in. Uh, I do. I'm going to send you the LinkedIn post I made about it uh, just just recently. But yeah, it, it, life life changing. First time I did it was in Lake Michigan back in 2014. I just wanted wow. to try it. Felt like I was being reborn. Very painful. Oh my though. gosh. Yeah, I'll send you there's some so stuff. Many, there's so many health benefits, you know, and they and a they lot talk of about health Wim, benefits. They talk about James Nestor talks about uh, the Wim Hof method in in his book, and yeah, there's I mean, there's a lot of a lot of great science behind it that um, leads to health benefits and that's and right. Demonstrates and, and longevity, um, 
and just living a living a longer, healthier life, right? I mean, it's one Absolutely. of the challenges. I mean, we didn't get into this subject, but you know, medical science has come so far, and it's it's keeping us alive. Um, uh, but our our you know our we're not we're not living longer, uh, mm-hmm. but it's keeping us alive to a certain age. But the problem is, our last ten years, you know, the quality of life for people in the last ten years is just it's not great. And so, um, r- really, uh, I mean, I think that's going to be the next big medical challenge as, as we have all these you know aging aging people that are are living to the the, the you know eighties and nineties, but. A lot, of, a lot of times their last 10 years is not the quality of life isn't there. And so oh, it's going to be a big challenge. I completely challenge. agree. And I, you know, I'll, I'll send you some really interesting stuff on that. Like me, I'm, I'm 35. My report card is going to be due when I'm in my 40s. So right now I'm taking very seriously. So aside from like ice baths and everything, how do I manage stress? How do I, how do I breathe mm. properly? How do, how do I have sleep? High? Sleeping is a skill. Um, mm. And, you know, what's, what's, um, it's interesting. I heard this, and uh, we'll, we'll get to the last question. Uh, there's a cardiologist who said something, and this is part of the reason why I started doing ice baths, which is mm-hmm. exercising my vasculature, vasoconstricting mm-hmm. and vasodilating. He said, "You're only as old as your arteries." Mm. Yeah. And I, think, I think there's a lot of truth in that. A lot of truth. I love that. I mean, so you would love this book. Um, another book for you, David Sinclair, uh, a book called Lifespan and Why We Age and Why We Don't Have to, and and I that, love that you're telling me about books I have not heard. I mean, there's millions of books, yeah. but I, yeah. you know, I read a lot, so I'm excited to hear about books I have not heard about. So, lifespan, yeah. lifespan. It's David Sinclair, and um, it's, he touches on a lot of things we're talking about here. It, um, you know, ice baths. There's you know, there's something about, and and it's, it's there's a he goes into it in detail, but it triggers triggers things at a very kind of cellular level um, that helps to repair DNA and, and increases longevity. <laughs> Um, you know, calorie caloric restriction, which is fairly, fairly very well, well good. Known and yeah, so there's a bunch My, of mitochondrial into this. Yeah, I was say yep. training your mitochondria, getting them, getting them stronger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're you're definitely coming back on the show. That's yeah. that's just like it's <laughs> so gonna, it's the, happening. You'd love, you'd love this book, then you'd love it. It's it, it touches on all this stuff, and he's a Harvard uh, professor who's who's really understands the science and the research behind a lot of these things. Fantastic. I'm ordering this. I mean, his, I'm ordering you know, this his, now. His, his, his a fast, fascinating uh, kind of thesis in the book, which is that um, uh, a- aging is something that can be can be cured. He thinks of it as a disease and mm. that it's not not inevitable and that uh, we are in his opinion, we are very, very, very close to understanding the mechanisms that cause it. And and hence he makes a very bold statement that. He says it's um, we're soon to be at the point where we will be able to quote unquote cure aging, and it'll, the solution will be easier than than curing cancer. That's that's a bold claim by I really <laughs> yeah I really like that a lot. There's something to be said about this stuff now, and I think that you know there's a level of consciousness that's happening globally, and let's just say here in the U.S. between looking into things like this early on, which is like what can I do now to get even healthier and increase my longevity, things like like this podcast. I feel like we're in the a second wave of the Gutenberg you know revo- revolution in the sense that this is the first time in history where somebody let's say somebody's working a blue collar working working a nine to five job can spend an hour while they're working out or driving educating yeah. themselves about a podcast, learning about something new, trying something out in, in the evening. I think there's a, oh. that's a very unique thing about the United States. My wife noticed this when she came here is like this idea of innovation, entrepreneur, just trying things is it's like deeper in our culture than we realize. For me, I take it for granted, but when she came yeah. here, you know, she has a passion of cooking. So I said, why don't let, let's start a YouTube channel. So she started, she has a bunch of subscribers. And I said, why mm-hmm. don't you just try selling your food? She, she did like a little meal plan. So like this, this, uh, yeah. uh spirit Crash is so just- strong here. It really is. And it's just, and it's just accelerating. I mean, we're on this exponent. I mean, what, what's, you know, you're right. We need to, we, I need to come down there. And we need to spend some time together. Um, Absolutely. You know, we're, we're on this exponential curve, right? But we don't realize it, right? I mean, because we, we, we are, humans are linear thinkers because we, we, we can't see, we don't have the perspective to see the exponential curve that we're actually on, but we're on kind of this really accelerating part of the curve. Um, and all the things you're talking about, the way the access to data and information and distributing information is just accelerated so fast that anyone, you know, from a grassroots level can start their own company and, 
and uh, and create an, you know something amazing with very little resources. Yeah, Metcalf's law is definitely alive and well, I, like mm -hmm. very very much so. Dave, last question for you, man. I want to keep I want to keep going. But again, you know, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate you spending, you know, this much time. I feel like I won because I know that, uh, you know, general counsel was on to just kind of monitor things and they dropped off like 30, 45 minutes ago. I'm like, oh man, I was like, so, so like now, like now look, let, let's just start talking about all kinds of things that are going to get us in trouble. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a choice. This is rare. I'm going to give you, you've been okay. such a great guest. And, uh, so I'm going to give you a choice of one of these two questions and maybe this, the one you choose not to answer, we can ask you that when you come back. Yeah, you can either time. choose, you can choose, you can choose the billboard question or the painful memory question. Which one do you want okay. to go with? Oh, wow. Okay. I'll go with the painful memory. Got it. Kind of self-masochist, oh. right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like I said, I, I always choose hard problems. <laughs> you like, choose yeah. hard. I, I love it. That's, I, that's, that's, hey, look, we're, we're, we're on the same page. I would have chose, I would have made it's the same choice. stick with the theme. So throughout your life, you've had many people who mentored you, taught you, guided you, mm -hmm. you know, from your parents to siblings, if you have any, your teachers, your friends, etc. throughout your entire life, again, from the time you were mm -hmm. a young boy till now. So this mm -hmm. is not just professionals, it's anybody. Along the way, people taught you lessons. Mm -hmm. And behavior change, a lot of times it, you, you change your behavior when there's enough pain to change. What mm -hmm. was the most painful thing? that a mentor or somebody you admired told you something that really hurt you a lot, but it forced you to change for the better. Hmm. Wow. All right. Let me think about this. You know, I think I, okay. So here's a, it's an interesting example. I, I, I played football in high school and, um, and I was lucky enough to start varsity as a freshman um wow not that's impressive not, not necessarily because i was that good i think it, maybe there just wasn't any other good players playing my position <laughs> dave just take dave take the compliment just take the compliment. <laughs> yeah. but, okay um but my my senior year uh mm -hmm. i was asked to move from that position that i had played my whole you know freshman summer and junior you know three years and what then, position was that it was it was called outside linebacker strong safety got it Okay. And, All right. And um, I was asked asked to play um, cornerback because it's a big change. there wasn't there was a big change, and it's not as fun of a position in my in my opinion it at sucks. the time. It was <laughs> well, yeah. I, did, a lot I, of I enjoyed running a lot of running I, backwards. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed the outside linebacker position, and that um, that was really hard. Like that, you know, because I, I thought I you know I mean I had been in this position for three years. I was like kind of the, I was a ca captain of the team. Um, but I was asked to play this position because there was a, you know, stronger, bigger kid to play the strong safety position. And they didn't have a fast, quick person to play the cornerback position. So, you know, I had to kind of um, swallow my pride and swallow kind of what I really wanted to do and all these other things to really do what was right for the team. Um, and that was a, that was a, that was a big, a, an important lesson for me because it was the right thing to do. You know, we, we went on to play in the state championships and, um, and so it was the right thing to do to, to kind of, um, seems like kind of a silly, kind of a silly example, but, you know, Not at all. really, really understanding that sometimes you have to sacrifice, put some, make a, make some sacrifice for what's the right thing to do to, to, for the overall team benefit of the team and to, and to overall win right to do the best thing overall and to optimize for the group and so that that was a, a great lesson for me um and i remember my coach saying uh you know adversity builds character you know he you know he said that, you know this is a hard thing for you you've you've had this position for a long time and but adversity builds character and this is going to this is going to help you grow so i think that 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 was a lesson that i've taken with me ever since then love i love that i think that's such a such a great lesson and and I, I feel like the best answers I've gotten uh, when I ask that question usually comes from somebody's childhood that's usually not professionally related, um, but something that might seem benign, but really um, has a lot of wisdom to it. And I think if the audience reflects on the story you just shared, you know, they can find a lot to take action on. Uh, Dave, 
this has been this has been great. I know we can keep going, but you have you you, you have things yep. to do. So we're gonna definitely have you back on. Thank you so much for for coming on the show. Stay on for a few seconds after I uh, uh, click stop the recording. Thank you everyone for joining. And for those of you who are physicians, keep in mind this uh, podcast is being uh, powered powered by CMFI, which means that your your reflection on this podcast is eligible for an ACCME credit. So just check the links below and. Type in your credit again, you'll get a CME credit for your reflection. And for those of you who are going to get those books that Dave uh, just talked about, support the show. Please use the affiliate links in the notes below and buy the books through there. Please help us out. This has been another episode of the State of MedTech. I'm your head of state and host Omar Khatib, and we'll see you all next time.